standing for the word of God, continuing with Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer must be first to partake the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffer as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. And this is the word of God. Amen. All right. Good morning to you. How are you guys doing? All right. Hey, if you are online, welcome. Thank you for joining with us. If we could bring the house lights up. We are in 2 Timothy this morning. Um, first of all, if you would online, just check in. Let us know that you are there. Also, that's helpful for community. And while we're here, why don't you go ahead and if you're in the sanctuary, say hello to someone around you and uh, just make sure you remember their name by the end of service. Yes. All right, middle school is uh, released. If you're in middle school, you guys are out this morning. All right. So this morning, um, last, if you remember about a month ago, first Sunday of the month, we are usually in the Redwood Grove out back. Uh, we have an agape feast. And so uh, last week we were thinking, hey, should we be inside or outside? And last week we were inside. And you see the weather turning so quickly right now. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a blessing just to see fall. Also, middle school is released. I said that, but I guess my mic was not. So uh, middle school, you guys are out this morning. This morning we are looking at entrusting future leaders. And the passage that Judy read, we were planning to go to verse 13, but I'm looking at my notes realizing Ain't no way we're going to get to 13. So we're going we're gonna to go to 10 this morning. And this morning as we look at it and trusting future leaders, uh, we are going to look at uh, this sacred trust that we have. Uh, a good soldier of Jesus Christ, uh, the competitive athlete, the hardworking farmer, and then to remember Jesus and his prisoner. So we're going to dig right in this morning. Remember that Paul is writing to Timothy um, Paul knows the end of his life is coming. Paul knows that he is just about ready to finish his own race. And so Timothy 
has this sacred trust in order to take the message of the gospel. And I want you to consider this. Think about what this is like. The message that Paul is giving is the message that is going to change the whole world. And he knows that. He also knows that in that first generation of apostles that some of them have already died because they testified of Jesus. So he is passing this message on to Timothy, saying, Timothy, this message is so important that not only do you hold on to this, but then you give it to others also. And this is a sacred trust. You know, I, I think about, um, I love dystopian movies for whatever reason, you know, like uh, the apocalypse types of things and trying to survive. And there's always this thing where they are, you know, the survivors are somewhere and, and uh, they are trying to get away, but then they hear like Morse code or something that's going over the airwaves that says, we're here, you know, there's safety, go to Atlanta or whatever it is. There's this message that is given to them. And when I think about that, or I think about World War II and what that was like for the wind talkers, the Native American Indians that they used Navajo in order to speak so that the Nazis or the Axis powers wouldn't be able to crack that code. Something is being entrusted that is so important that it's life or death. And Paul has something that is going to be entrusted to Timothy that is so important that he wants Timothy to treat it as such. He wants T Timothy to take that message and to hold on to it. And he says in chapter 2, verse 1, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I think about this father-son relationship that Paul has with Timothy. It's a relationship in which it's more than just um, they worked together. It's more than just a mentorship, the way that if you're um, in working in business, maybe you have a mentor and that person in business is trying to show you more about business. This is a relationship in which Timothy is like a son to Paul. And Paul writes to him about being strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. There is a huge need today for discipleship from one generation to another generation. We um, have always, there, there's always been generation gaps. When my dad, um, when my brother was in high school, I remember the arguments. My, my brother had this room, it was a really cool room, posters everywhere. You could not see the wall. And then posters on the ceiling, the, the, the ceiling was covered with posters. And then he had these cool beads that hung in his doorway, and uh, these beads were there, and, and then he had this black light and a lava lamp, and we turn on the black light, all of a sudden, everything would kind of light up, and all of these colors, you would kind of see it. And he and my dad, my dad being, you know, from the World War II generation, and um, your hair had to be above the ears. And it had to be above the collar. And it was a time when like everybody was growing out long hair. And my brother wanted to have this long hair. And my dad and my brother, they would just go at it in these kind of culture clashes of generations. Um, what was known in the 70s, like the hippies. My brother was kind of the, the tail end of that. That was a struggle at that time. But the struggle between generations right now, I believe, is even greater. And I believe it's greater primarily because of technology and the ways that when kids were younger, they would have to ask, ask their parents, how do you do these things? And it was funny, uh, my son Josiah, I had him change out a faucet in our house. And I said, hey, uh, here's all the stuff I don't have time to show you right now. I said, but I'll show you later. And he goes, oh, don't worry about it. What did he say? <laughs> I'll just YouTube it. And so I come home and this faucet is put in better than probably I would have instructed him. He found that specific faucet and a YouTube tutorial to go step by step, which is great. Okay, that's fantastic. But what can easily happen is that younger generations can think, I don't really need an older generation because I could learn all of these things from someone else online. In fact, it's the older generation that has to come to the younger generation to say, can you teach me how to get onto this app? Uh, you know, I'm trying to, like my mom used to do this thing. It was really funny. Uh, she would send me messages and I would say, how did you send it? Did you email it to me? She said, I sent it over the internet. And I said, what, what, what does that mean? And she would say, I 
I don't remember. I, I sent it on the internet. And I was like, the internet, mom, that's like this big thing. It's like this, there's, uh, did you do a Facebook message? Did you, I don't know. And so what was funny is she would be on a friend of mine, their Facebook page, and they became friends with her, and she would write letter notes to me, sometimes letters on their page. And so <laughs> Matthew, and then she would give me all this advice and she would write it out. What would happen? Eventually, they would, they would forward it to me. Oh, Matt, your mom, it's, it's great. She wrote you this long letter. It's on my Facebook page. I copied it. I pasted it. Here you go. Here's the message. And then she would ask me this question over the phone. Did you get the message? And I would say, well, yeah, I got it. But like, I didn't know. And she said, see, I just sent it over the internet. So she kind of had this mindset. As long as she sent it into cyberspace on the interweb, somehow it's going to magically get to me because that was her intention for it. And, and so my nephew, Kenny, it, it, we, we set up her iPad where he just said, Grandma, just touch this button. And, and it was just this icon, this one picture. She didn't have to go to Facebook. She didn't have to go to email. She just had to press it. And then he said, whatever you type there, then hit send. And it's going to go, go to, it'll go to Uncle Matt. So, but when it comes to passing on the faith, it's not only about knowledge. It's not only here, Timothy, here are these principles, here is some head knowledge, here are some theological and doctrinal concepts. No, their relationship was like a father and son. And relationship in discipleship gets passed on way more in, in the face-to-face, the one-to-one, the being-together contact than it does by just here's a book and go ahead and read the book. So Paul is writing to Timothy, We need older women and younger women. We need relationships in which every 16-year-old should know a 6-year-old and a 60-year-old at the church. We shouldn't walk right by people if they are not of our generation. We shouldn't see them as, oh, a young person, oh, an older person, oh, someone. And, And we should begin to see one another in family. Family is so important because generation to generation, things are passed on. I, um, I watched um, this video recently of, uh, do you guys know what a haka is? Those dances? Uh, a haka like in New Zealand or um, sometimes they would, they would be in, uh, there's other, other countries that have these. They're, they're the dances where they stomp and then they hit their chest and then they make all the faces and they do all these things. I, I saw, maybe you guys have seen that. It's a wedding. There's this wedding video. And there's a woman that is getting married to this man, and from her ethnicity, from her, her group of people, a haka is so important because it passes down values. It passes down this culture. And so her husband, who is not of that culture, yet as they come to the wedding, the whole wedding party memorized this dance together. And as they're doing this dance, and what they're trying to do is exude emotion as they're doing it. It, it, she just starts weeping because she's realizing my husband and the people in the wedding party, two families are joining together, but they understand how important this is to me, how important family is. Paul is writing to Timothy, not just like, hey, Timothy, you are an assistant pastor. I'm going to give you a message and you give it to someone else. Paul shared with him his life. And that's why when we go back to that scripture, he says, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Paul wants him to be strong. Remember that Timothy um, is not necessarily timid. Timothy is sometimes he is portrayed, but like Paul's troubleshooter in a lot of ways. It, it seems like Paul puts him in difficult situations, which are so difficult that anyone would go through stress. Anyone would go through this kind of tension. And it could also be that Paul, the older that he's getting, has more grace. You remember John Mark left them in the middle of their mission. And then Paul and Barnabas, they are going on another mission. And Barnabas says, hey, I want to take John Mark with us. And Paul says, no way. He left us. So Paul is not going to have a slouch be put in Ephesus. So I think that there's something about Timothy where Timothy needs the strength. Timothy is a strong person. But even the strongest of us have times of weakness. There's not a person that you think of in your mind and go, oh, that person is so strong that doesn't have moments of insecurity, that doesn't have moments of feeling the task that is before me is too great for me. 
You ever feel that way in your job, as a parent, in your marriage, in your ministry? This entrustment of the faith is going to be so great for Timothy. He needs to be strong, but he wants Timothy to know that strength doesn't come from just this inward fortitude where you pull yourself up by the scruff of the neck and you pull on your own bootstraps and you just go forward. He's telling him, Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So we know about that kind of grace. Paul had written about that kind of grace. Now, there is the saving grace. We realize that Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for we are saved by grace through faith, not of works, not of ourselves, lest anyone should boast. It's, it, we're not saved because we did enough good. We, we're not saved because of what we can give to God. We are not saved by head knowledge. We are not saved through other people vouching for us. It, it's through being born again through the grace of God and holding and, and trusting to the message of the gospel, what Jesus has done for us. We have to be born into this family, spiritually born. I'm not talking about a physical birth. So the Christian life and salvation, it starts with weakness. It starts with us saying, I can't do it. There is something that is above and beyond me. But it's not just a saving grace. There's a grace that sustains us. Paul, when he was writing to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, said this, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Somehow, God allowed Paul to go through these trials as Satan was attacking Paul in order for Paul to be dependent on the Lord. It goes on to say, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches in needs and persecutions and distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So what Paul is telling Timothy is, Timothy, I know that you feel intimidated at times. I know that the circumstances are more than you could handle. I know that you are placed in a task, in a mission that is above and beyond what you can do. But in the midst of that, allow your weakness to be this thing that turns you to the Lord and it's his grace that will sustain you. Then he told him the things you heard from me among many witnesses. Paul was the same person in private as he was in public. He didn't just put on pastoral persona. There's some people that maybe in one place act one way and another place act another way. And hopefully you're the same person no matter who you're with. Because Paul said, these things you heard from me among many witnesses. Now what you're to do, Timothy, is you are to commit these to faithful men, faithful people who will be able to teach others also. So we're to give what's been entrusted to us, which is really the message of hope and life. And we need to give that to others. There's this kind of a, a value, kind of an ethic today that in, in a sense says, what's good for you is good for you. What's good for me is good for me. And I love you and I respect you so much that whatever you say is good for you, I also hold that that's good for you. Does that make sense? But that's not, it doesn't make sense. It makes sense like you understand it, but it doesn't make sense if someone is doing something that is detrimental to them. See, the message of life, the message of the gospel that's given to us is not given to us just so that we could receive it and hold on to it. We're stewards. And that's an entrustment that we must give to others so that other people can teach other people. The reason why we have this message of 2 Timothy is that someone taught me and someone taught the person before me and someone taught that person before them and someone entrusted that message to before them. And we can go all the way to Paul giving this to Timothy and we're reading this today. And if the Lord tarries, if Jesus doesn't come back soon in our lifetime, my heart, my prayer for us is that we're entrusting this message to others. I mean, uh, the heart for Santa Cruz County is that there would be faithful churches, faithful Christians, that if God doesn't, if Christ doesn't come back, that generations from now are still preaching the gospel. 
they're still being faithful. They're still being strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And remember that this message is so important. Um, there was a book written probably around 2012 by um, Josh McDowell, who wrote Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Um, he probably one of the greatest Christian apologists uh, of, of our whole lifetime. And he wrote a book called The Last Christian Generation. And when he wrote the book, you know, I, I read that and I remember like this is right around 2012, maybe 2010. And I was like, at first I was thinking that's hyperbole. Is he, is he exaggerating? But then I heard an interview with him and he said, I'm not exaggerating. I want to make sure that we realize we are always one generation away from apostasy, from people going away from the faith. And every generation faces that same mission to receive and hold on to the truth of God's word and then pass that on to others who will pass that on to others. So we are all called to this. And Paul says, commit these to faithful people who will be able to teach others also. Now he's going to give three examples, three pictures of what that looks like. To give these things to others. How to endure hardship. He's going to talk about a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. We're going to, first of all, look at this good soldier of Christ. Paul says, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. So we are to endure hardship. We are to be good soldiers of Christ. We're not to entangle ourselves with the affairs of this life. We want to please the one that enlisted us. Now, there are many examples um, in times of war, in times of battle, to glean from. And because my dad became a U.S. citizen from the Philippines, joining the U.S. Navy at the tail end of World War II, the things that, when I think about World War II and that generation, it always fascinates me. It fascinates me because we were so close, it was so close. It hung in the balance when you read about People like Winston Churchill, who gave courage to uh, Great Britain. Um, when you read about MacArthur and, and these people, and that history is quickly fading from us because most of the World War II people, the people that fought during World War II have died. And because those stories are going away and people are not as fascinated with history as they used to be, it's almost like these are just foregone legends that we don't hear about anymore. But there is one thing that is important is that that valor, that enduring hardship, um, there are so many lessons from that. If you have ever um, seen the movie Saving Private Ryan, uh, that movie had such an emotional impact on me at the time that I saw it. I, I tried to show that to one of my daughters and I realized this is really violent. I forgot, like, it was just recent. I'm like, oh, you should see this. It was on Memorial Day. Hey, why don't you watch this with me? And she was just like, do I have to watch this? I'm like, yeah, let, maybe I'll just tell you about it. You don't have to watch all of it. it. It's pretty intense, just so you know. But I think for me, that intensity was valuable to be able to see it, to be able to try to picture that. And when... Um, the soldiers storm the beaches of Normandy. The, the scene that is depicted as soon as these, these boats opened up that, that hatch for the soldiers to be able to deploy, I mean, they're just taken on fire like crazy. Most of them wouldn't make it even to the beach in the first and second round. They would, they would just get mowed down. And when they interviewed many of the soldiers about this, in fact, Stephen Ambrose has a book called Citizen Soldiers about that World War II generation that was fascinating. Um, they asked them, what caused you to continue to press forward? Because, I mean, it would just be like a whole row, they're done. Then the next group, and, and they would just keep coming and relentless. They would just keep, keep going. What was it that kept them going? And maybe at the beginning for enlisting, Part of it was wanting to have freedom in our nation. And, and we have 
just incredible respect for soldiers that enlist, men and women that say, hey, I, I want to so that you could be at church on a Sunday morning so that you are at your home and you're safe. I'm willing to enlist or to sign up. When I think about this though, most of them, when it came to going forward, maybe that's why they joined or they were drafted or they saw the war, but in the time of battle, when everything is going crazy and they're hearing bullets hit metal all around them and they're seeing people die and they're hearing bombs go off, the thing that kept them going forward was the voice of their commanding officer and their fellow soldiers. At that point in time, what was most real to them was that commanding officer and their fellow soldiers. And Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says, you must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You know, they were able to see what the Roman legion was like. And the way that the Roman legion was so um, loyal to Caesar, even more so, Paul is saying, we are good soldiers of Jesus Christ. The word endure endure hardship. It's the quality or power of withstanding hardship or stress. It's having stamina or staying power. It's the ability to recover quickly. So when we think about the Christian being a good soldier and those of us that are entrusted with this gospel, first of all, we have to realize that there is a war. There's a battle right now for your soul and for the minds and souls of everyone. The thief only comes to rob, kill, and destroy. The Christian as a good soldier, we have to realize that we take orders from Jesus, that we're to obey him. We realize that we don't base what we do on what other people are doing, but we're here because we're good soldiers of Jesus Christ. And like the Navy SEALs, it's a volunteer platoon. In fact, Jesus in Luke chapter 9 He's journeying on the road and someone said, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Sometimes in emotionalism, we could, we could just say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow you. I'm going to do this. And we could kind of devote ourselves to something. But then Jesus, as they said that, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. He said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. So Jesus is, he challenges stability. He challenges comfort. He said to another in Luke 9, follow me. And he said, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Now that sounds very harsh and it is a, a very high calling, but there's something in the way that he's saying this, that it, it's as though maybe his father is still alive and he's saying, hey, eventually when my father dies, then I can come and follow you. Jesus challenges what relationships are most important. He challenges this also financial security. Don't wait until that. You need to follow me now. In, verse, uh, in Luke chapter 9, another said to him, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me go and bid farewell to those who are at my house. And Jesus said to him, and, and listen to the intensity of Jesus, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Is that so different than what is shared many times at churches today. It's almost like we're so afraid of people not following Jesus that we want to lower the bar and make it so easy, which faith is something that it's a free gift. Um, don't get me wrong, we don't earn it. But when it comes to being a follower of Jesus, it's almost like we want to lower the bar and make it so easy that there's no challenge to it. And I think that there are young people today that want to know that my life counts for something. The suicide rate is higher than it has ever been amongst young people because they're aimless. What is the purpose of my life? Why do I even exist? And I think the world needs to hear and we as Christians need to hear these messages from Jesus that bid us to follow the message from Paul to Timothy that you have to be a good soldier. You have to endure hardship and it will be very difficult. One thing to remember is this, that we are... Um, to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. He says, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. So what does that mean, the affairs of this life? One of the, the, the word is the word pragmatia, which is business or occupation, the affairs of this life. 
It's where we get the word pragmatic, what's practical. You know, at times, pragmatism is the enemy of the cross. Pragmatism is one of the greatest hindrances to the mission field, as so many times Christian parents say, well, you need to be practical. First, go get a college education. First, get a good job, and then you could earn a good living and then support missions. But don't go to the mission field. That's dangerous. Don't go to difficult places where you're going to have to sacrifice because we want to protect you from hardship. We want to protect you from difficulty. But that's not the way of the cross. The way of the cross means that there are going to be times when it is very difficult. And notice that It's to please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Nothing in my life is to rise above my desire to please the one who enlisted me. And in a sense, when I came to Christ, I gave up civilian life. What does that mean, civilian? Does it mean that we can't go to Rams 49er games? No, it doesn't. It was a great game, Monday Night Football. You know, like if, if my voice is fading, it's because I was yelling. And, and uh, some, uh, a friend, well, Justin Richter at, at uh, the church in Gilroy I used to pastor, someone from that church said, hey, Justin, I'm going to give you two tickets. You can invite someone. So Justin called me. And, was just, and we work on Sundays, so we can't go to many football games. But Monday night, and Justin's a diehard Rams fan, and I'm a diehard 49ers fan. It was an incredible thing. But yet... To entangle ourselves with the affairs of this life, I remember a point in time in my life where sports was so big, it was so much, that that became something that I would just think about even on Sunday mornings during the message. Like, would this guy just hurry up because the game is on? I need to go home. I need to go watch this game. And there's nothing wrong with watching the game. I was a football coach. I think there's a lot of great things that you can learn from it. But but I have to realize if my zeal for temporary things, civilian life, so to speak, is so much greater than my zeal for the Lord, then there's something wrong. And I'm not seeing what's truly important in my life. So that civilian life, there are so many things. We live in a world of distraction. Big, big, multi-billion dollar companies thrive on our distraction. They know They are grabbing, they are fighting for your attention because if they have your attention for them, that's more revenue. They measure screen time. How much time do you spend on that site, on that app, in that page? And the more time that you watch, the more time that you look at, the more it changes your algorithms on the other things that you see, the more money comes to those advertisers. There's a fight for our attention. And in civilian life, Realizing this, that, that we are, we're fighting a war and we don't realize that there's a war. There's a war of the mind. Listen to this by Tozier. He wrote, now I do not think that Satan cares to destroy us Christians physically. The soldier dead in battle who died performing some deed of heroism is not a great loss to the army, but may rather be an object of pride to his country. On the other hand, the soldier who cannot or will not fight but runs away at the sound of the first enemy is a shame to his family and a disgrace to his nation. So a Christian who dies in the faith represents no irreplaceable loss to the forces of righteousness on earth and certainly no victory for the devil. But when the whole regiments of professed believers are too timid to fight, too smug to be ashamed, surely it must bring an astringent smile to the face of the enemy. And it should bring a blush to the cheeks of the whole Christian church. The devil's master strategy for us Christians then is not to kill us physically, though there may be some special situations where physical death fits into his plan better, but to destroy our power to wage spiritual warfare. The average Christian these days is a harmless enough thing. Like, are we making an impact? Do we realize what we're doing or is it Sunday morning or is it ritual or is it just religion? There's something more to it. It's the message of hope for the whole world. It's not just the message of hope for us as Christians and like, hey, that's great for us as Christians, but then there's some other people that are atheists and whatever they like to do, that's good for them. And this other people, they have this other religion, whatever they do is good for them. And I'm not saying there aren't good people doing good things from different areas or learning good things, but the gospel is the message of salvation for everyone. 
and we are entrusted with it and we can't keep it to ourselves. We're supposed to share that with others by how we live and the things that we say. And if we live in a way that is compelling enough and loving enough, then the words that we say will matter. If it's only our words and we don't really care about people, why would they even listen? But when they know that we care about them, like Paul cares about Timothy, and he says, my son, and there's relationship there, then we hang on those words. I hung on the words of people that preached the gospel to me when I was growing up because those people loved me. Because I knew those people saw me as valuable. They cared about me. And because they cared about me, I cared about what they said. And I cared about what affected their lives. Remember this, that we are soldiers of Jesus Christ. Do you remember this scene from the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus is there and the soldiers come to arrest Jesus? And, and just previous to this, uh, Peter says, Eve, you know, Jesus says, all of you are going to forsake me. All of you are going to flee. And Peter is like, even if these chumps do, I won't. Okay, because I'm willing to die for you. Then what happens is the Roman soldiers come to arrest Jesus. There's a depiction there of Judas betraying Jesus with a kiss. And Peter wants to make good on what he said. And so he takes out his sword and he cuts off one of the soldier's ears. And he's fighting with him. And if you zero in on this picture that TMZ took of this fight, you see that uh, Peter is actually there in the foreground, you know, with this sword so this picture, now we don't have any pictures. It's just, it's just an artistic rendering. But I want you to think about this. When Jesus tells Peter, what does he say? He says, put away your sword. Put away your sword. In other words, in the kingdom, we fight differently. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't a place for strong uh, police or military or government using appropriate strength in battle or conflict but Paul is writing to Timothy about entrusting him with the gospel. And he's saying, in a sense, that Jesus' kingdom does not win people by dominance. We are good soldiers of Jesus Christ. And if Jesus says, put away your sword, it's one of the things that stumbled Peter. Man, because sometimes we just want to fight in a physical way. We want to fight in a, a way that attacks people. Where Jesus is telling us, no, the way that you fight as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, you love them. You lay down your life. You take up your cross. He goes on to talk about the competitive athlete. If anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. When I was in high school, I, I loved track and field. Um, I would follow track and field. We had something in Southern California called the Mount San Antonio Rela Mount Sac Relays, which is one of the best track and field events of the, of the whole country. And security back then was not like security now. There was a guy named Edwin Moses who ran the 400 meter hurdles that was undefeated in a hundred something races. And I just wanted to get to know Edwin Moses. So my friend and I in high school, we stole press passes. We just saw them. There was a table and it had press passes. And so like we grabbed these press passes. We walked down onto the field. I mean, we're high school students. This is ridiculous, right? And we have these lanyards that say press pass. And I walk right up to Edwin Moses after he finishes winning his, his this is like, I'm talking like if you know sports, this, this is like not quite the Super Bowl because that'd be the Olympics, but just down from there is the Mount Sac Relays. And I said, I went up to Edwin Moses and I'm asking for his autograph. He said, you know what? He's like, I, he appreciated my perseverance. He goes, I'll, I'll give it to you if you run my warm down lap with me. I ran his, after his race, I ran his warm down lap with Edwin Moses. It was awesome. And afterwards he signed it and I was like, I, I, so I, I followed these athletes. Carl Lewis was one of my favorites. He was undefeated in so many races. He wasn't the nicest guy when I asked for his autograph. He, he actually wouldn't even look at me. He just went like this and he signed it on someone else's picture. And I just walked away like kind of bummed. But in the Olympics, Carl Lewis ran against a guy named Ben Johnson. And it was the first time in so many, like I think it was two years of 100 meter finals that Carl Lewis lost to this guy named Ben Johnson. And everyone was shocked. Ben Johnson stunned the world, set the world record. Until a few days later, they find out that Ben Johnson was caught with steroids his performance enhancing drugs. And so he was stripped of his gold medal 
And Carl Lewis has given back the gold medal because he was the silver medalist and he got gold. And when Paul writes about if anyone competes in athletics, he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. You know, in today's, you know, in today's culture, in pastoral ministry, there are, it's easy to, there's a lot of Ben Johnsons. There's a lot of Ben Johnsons that they're, and we all have, by the way, this is to all of us. This is not to just those people. This is to me. This is to you. This is to all of us. We have to be so careful that the person that we portray to others is the real person. And it's not this person that everyone sees. Wow, look at like the Ben Johnson wins the gold medal. But then you find out something later on and has disqualified himself because he has not competed according to the rules. Timothy, you have to continue to compete. Be competitive according to the rules. If you look in history, a person that was competitive according to the rules um, was a, a guy named Jesse Owens. Really incredible. When Jesse Owens, this is a picture of him winning the gold medal in 1936, the Berlin Olympics. You know who is in charge at the time? This is in Berlin. This is in Germany. And that's why the guy next to him has the Hal Hitler sign, you know, going up. Because here's Jesse Owens that Hitler cannot stand. He doesn't want uh, Jesse to win anything. And he would not stand when Jesse wins this. But you know why Jesse won that? One of the reasons why Jesse won the long jump, um, in track and field, there's a board that you must jump from. And if you are a centimeter over the board, that's called a scratch. It doesn't count. Even if you're farther than everyone else by a whole foot, it's called a scratch. And Jesse Owens had gone through all of his jumps. And in all of his jumps, he was over by this much. He's beating the field as far as how far he could jump by, by a long distance but he is like just a little bit over. So a German athlete, uh, this German athlete comes up to him and he tells him, hey, one of the things that I see is that when you are jumping, and this guy's name is Luz Long, he tells him, if I put something down on the runway, instead of jumping from the board, you jump from that. I'm gonna put my, I don't know if it's his shirt his coat, you jump from there because you're beating everyone else by a long distance. And even if you're far behind the edge of the board, you're still going to beat us. So on Jesse Owens' last jump, he jumps from the mark that this German athlete puts out and Jesse Owens beats all of them and gets the gold medal. See, when it comes to competing according to the rules, it's not just the letter of the law. To the letter of the law, Luz Long realized I could beat Jesse Owens today because he keeps scratching on all of his jumps and all of his attempts. But I am going to help him by being a good sportsman to show him, here, here's what I'm going to do to help you. See, it's not just about following rules. The Pharisees, many of them were into following rules, but the heart, the heart wasn't there. So they could follow the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law is what's important as well. And what Paul is writing to Timothy about is following those rules, you know, to, to compete. And if Jesus Christ is the one that enlisted us and we want to please him, then he looks at the heart and not only what we do, but he looks at why we do it. He also looks at how we do it and how we do it and why we do it have to also please the master who enlisted us. And then he talks about the hardworking farmer. The hardworking farmer must be the first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. This hardworking farmer, it's almost synonymous, right? Hardworking and farmer. There's probably not a whole lot of lazy farmers. A hardworking farmer must be the first to partake of the crops. If, Timothy, you are going to preach these words to others, you need to listen to it. You need to imbibe it. You need to take it in yourself before you give it to others. Before we teach anyone any of these things, we need to run our own lives through the things that God is teaching us. Are we partaking of what God has given to us before we help others? Now, this hardworking farmer, when I was thinking about a picture, I, you know, a lot of times I'll just do a Google search for a picture, hardworking farmer. Most of them 
are modern pictures with tractors, and it is so scientific now. Some of those tractors, some of those combines are actually robotic, and you just like, you have to be really, you know, know how to use a computer because you're going to have to do these things. But in an agrarian culture that Paul was writing in, just like in other parts of the world, it is hard work by hand. And the Christian that is going to be successful in not only following the Lord in his or her own life, but in trusting that, we cannot be lazy. We cannot be lazy. It is, it, there's hard work involved in it. Remember what I said last week, God is not against effort, he's against earning. And by earning, what I meant by that was trying to earn our approval, trying to earn salvation. He's, trying, he's against us trying to earn those things. But effort, sometimes the message of the free gift of God, of grace, becomes so easy without any cost to it that people mistakenly say, all I have to do is pray this magic prayer and then I go to heaven and then it doesn't matter what I do and I could do whatever I want and they don't understand the gospel. The hardworking farmer, we're to pass these things on to others. It's a lot of hard work. As a Christian, as a pastor, as a leader, there is hard work involved. We must be the first to partake of the crops and he says, consider what I say and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. And we're going to close quickly, but I wanted to share some things that Damien Kyle shared one time at a pastor's conference. He's the pastor at Calvary Chapel Modesto where there are a lot of farmers at his church. And so he asked these farmers, hey, can I sit down with you? And I want to ask you some things about farming that will help me to relate those things to my Christian walk and to me being a pastor. And here are some of the things they came up with. The Christian must be hardworking. The Christian must be patient. Um, The farmer has to take a long view of things. You don't see the effects of what you do today, today. You don't see the effects today. You don't plant something, you just see it grow right then. You plant it today, you work, you till the field, it's difficult. You see the results later. The Christian, like the farmer, must have perseverance. Farmers must keep farming. They have to stick with it. They don't have to be the most talented or gifted, but they do have to keep working without quitting. They have to realize that there are seasons of farming and sometimes you will have good crops and sometimes you'll have poor crops. Farmers have to prepare the land before you even begin to plant. They need to plant and then they need to harvest and then they need to prune and they need to till the land. They said that the farmer must accept that there can be bad years because of things that are outside of his control. There are gonna be things that are outside of your control in life and you're facing some of them whether it would be sickness or the way someone else responds to you or whether it would be a fire that hits in the Santa Cruz mountains, there's going to be things that are outside of our control. The way that someone that we love responds and we can't control them. And during those times when things are outside of our control, the setbacks, so many variables, we have to apply the same faithfulness year in and year out, no matter how big the crop is. A farmer must accept the fact that things will never be perfect. And the farmer must accept the fact that much of the work is obscure and people will never see what it is that you do. In the Christian walk, the things that are produced in fruit happen because of things that no one ever sees most of the time. There are things that happen in private. There are things that happen in your quiet time. The farmer must be attentive to his field and to his crop every day. Proverbs 27, 23 says, be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. So if you are a small group leader for a life group, if you oversee a ministry, if you have a family, attend to those needs. Look at those needs. If you're in children's ministry, whatever ministry that you're a part of, whatever group that God has you a part of, Um, The farmer must be learning and growing. Learn from older, more experienced farmers. The farmer must treat the workers with respect. People work better when they know that they're loved and respected. The farmer must sow good seed. Have you ever bought seeds for a thing at the store or at like um, Home Depot or, you know, at, at, uh, you know, the nursery? And it says percent of weeds, acceptable weeds. Have you ever noticed that? So like you're planting grass, but then you have these seeds and it says percent of acceptable. You might, you might buy a pack and not know it says 
percent of acceptable weeds, 90%. Like you, you need to know the seeds that you're planting. So when we plant the word of God, one of the reasons why we study the Bible and we go from verse to verse and we look at it is because we need all of it. And as we're doing that, you know, I, I watch a, a show. I am addicted to a show. It's one of my um, affairs of this life things that I'm like super into and I have to be careful of. It's the show called Alone. Have you guys ever seen that? It's on the History Channel. They drop these people off in remote places in the Arctic and they see how long they could survive. And the person that survives the longest gets a million dollars. It's awesome. So good. And they don't... And this one guy killed a moose. He killed a moose. And he's like, I am going to win this show because I killed a moose. And all these other people are catching squirrels and rabbits and fish. This moose is going to last the whole time. So I'm just going to hunker down in my shelter and have a moose. They have health checks once a week. And the people that come to check his health, they told him, you are in danger right now of being, they, they disqualify them if their organs are starting to shut down, if they're losing too much weight because it's a danger to them. We're going to take you out of here. And he's like, how can I be starving? I have a moose. I'm eating moose every day. Moose is super, super lean meat. It doesn't have fat and it doesn't have carbs. So even though this guy is eating all this meat, he's in ketosis because of all the hard work that he has to do all the time. And he is starving on all of this protein. You know what that is? At times that is just like reading little verses in a promise box that you have. I'm not against that by the way, you know, or a calendar and you like read a verse and you kind of like, okay, the verse for the day or whatever. And like, sometimes we could just eat moose. Like we're, we're just eating things that are fun for us. We're in the book of Proverbs or we're in Psalms, but man, there's some hard stuff. There's other things for us. There's this whole part of Paul writing, saying to the Corinthians, I wanted to give you meat, but I could only give you milk. We could go deeper. We could be stronger, but we need a well-rounded diet. We need community. We need fellowship of the body of Christ. If we don't have that, we're going to get weak. If we're not serving, we're not exercising our spiritual muscles or our gifts, we're going to get weak. We have to be the first to partake. And then that has to be that well-balanced uh, eating of it so that we have something to give. The farmer must to give must give attention to his or her personal life. We have to give, listen to this quote. This blew me away. The farmers that Damien spoke to without exception said that they did not know of one single farmer that lost his farm due to weather, but they each knew of several farmers that lost their farm due to an unstable life. Alcoholism or financial, you know, uh, you know, unwise financial things, and they just lost it. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't keep going. So we have to keep our eyes on the prize, and we need to realize there's a harvest. And finally, Paul writes, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Paul doesn't say like he has another gospel. What he's saying is the gospel is so much a part of me that I now consider it mine. Is it yours this morning? Or is this Paul's gospel or is this the gospel of the Bible? Or is this Matt's gospel or someone else's gospel? Have you held on to it so you could say, this is now my gospel? This is not just the good news for other people. This is the good news for me. That's what Paul is saying to Timothy. For which I suffer, suffer trouble as an evildoer. In our world today, by following the Lord and by pleasing God, you might suffer trouble as an evildoer according to the culture of the world. And the culture of the world might look at what you're doing to be faithful and you're, they're saying, hey, you're going to suffer as an evildoer even though what you're doing is not evil. Even to the point of chains, but the word of God is not chained. The last thing that Paul does is he leaves Timothy with not only the soldier and the athlete and the farmer, but now remember Jesus Christ and remember me, his prisoner. Jesus died, he was sentenced, he was tried, he was persecuted, but he had done no wrong. Jesus also resurrected. So Timothy, no matter how hard things get, no matter what happens, no, this life isn't an end in and of itself. There's something after this life. If there weren't something after this life and if the gospel weren't true, then yeah, it's just a matter of opinion and whatever you think is good for you, it's good for you. Whatever's good for me is good for me. 
But if the resurrection happened, if Jesus really came to this world, if he really died, if he really rose again, then we have to take him seriously. And part of that taking him seriously is that we take it into our own lives, even if we have to suffer. Are you willing to suffer for the gospel? Okay, well, maybe not prison. What about friends? What if some friends, because you're faithful to Jesus and you love them and you want them to know Christ and you share it with them and they get angry and they disown you as a friend, are you a true friend if you never tell them the truth? Are you a true friend if that person goes into eternity without Christ and, and they could say, well, Matt was so nice to me, but never told me anything. What if my sister can say, well, Matt was such a good brother, but he never told me anything. What if I could say that about my, you see, there is something about saying what is true in love, not to degrade other people with respect. And the time is coming when there's, in Canada right now, like a, a laws against proselytizing, laws against sharing the gospel on a street where they're trying to put people in jail for doing, so. in Canada, that used to be the place that you wanted to run to. Do you remember that? Like everyone wanted to go to Canada to get away. And yet, if these things are happening, are we willing to be faithful? See, at the end of it, verse 10, therefore, I endure all things. Paul saying, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, for God's chosen, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So Paul says, yes, it will be hard but I'm going to keep enduring and I'm not going to give up because I'm not just doing it for myself. I'm doing it for Christ, but I'm also enduring for the sake of the elect. Are you willing to suffer difficulty in bringing the gospel to others in spite of the fact that by doing that makes it difficult for you? See, we, we look at missionaries in other parts of the world and we think, okay, there are varsity Christians because they left their country and they gave up everything, they're serving the Lord. And I'm JV, or I'm Frosh Sof, and really it doesn't matter. I'm just, I'm just a Christian. I'm just a normal Christian. So I'm not called to sacrifice. I'm not called to suffer. I'm not called to persecution. No, God's called all of us to this. And while this is particular to pastors and people in ministry and people that are entrusted with the gospel, it is not only to people that are entrusted with the gospel as, as ministers or as pastors. This is to all of us. And I pray that should the Lord tarry, that he would find us faithful. Our, our commanding officer, the one that enlisted us, how? By giving his own life, by showing us the example, by laying down his life for us. And he says, now will you go and tell other people about it? Will you go and tell other people about me? It's not a thing. It's not a, a being into it. It's, it's following Jesus. It's being into a him. It's being into the person. And so as I close in prayer, maybe you've never enlisted and maybe you've never said, Jesus, I need that grace in my own life. That grace, the gift of God is free. There's a cost to following. The gift is free. You're not earning this. But when you receive it, not only is there a cost, but there's incredible blessing. Every farmer, every athlete, every soldier must know that there's something that they're working for, competing for, fighting for. They're not looking at the here and now. They're looking at something that is, that is future. They are looking at the camaraderie and the blessing of fellow farmers, fellow athletes, um, fellow soldiers. And all of those, when people leave those things, what do they miss the most? I miss my brothers and sisters that were in those foxholes or in, in the military because we all had that same kind of heart. What do people that retire from professional sports miss from team sports? I miss the camaraderie of my teammates. I miss having a whole team where all of us were pulling towards one goal together and giving everything for it. So don't only think of the cost, also remember the blessing because the blessing and what we gain is so much more than the cost. We can't even compare it. So Father, this morning we thank you for your word. God, we have seen the pictures that you have given to us of the hardworking farmer, the athlete, the soldier. 
And God, I, I just confess, Lord, I, I'm, not, um, I'm not in a place where when I look at my life compared to all of these pictures that you set up in Scripture where my own disciplines and my own zeal um, lives up at times to those things that, that are put before us, put before me. But God, I thank you that this morning we could be strong in your grace. That you always set a standard that is out of our reach without your grace. And with your grace, God, we thank you that you just pick us up and you're proud of us because of Christ. And so God, I want to pray right now for anyone that has never received Christ as their Savior and their Lord to follow. I pray that today would be that day. If that's you, that you would open up your heart to say, Jesus, please forgive me for my sin. Thank you for dying for me on the cross. And my trust is in something I don't fully understand yet, but I I believe. I ask that you would help my unbelief. I thank you for dying for me. I thank you that you rose again. And I ask that you would fill me with your spirit, help me to follow and to be faithful. And Father, for those of us that have received Christ and are followers, we ask for strength and resilience. God, for those that are suffering hardship, God, would you give them an extra sense of resilience that comes as a gift from your spirit. God, we thank you this morning for your word. We pray that you would help us to continue to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As we worship the Lord together, if any of you would desire prayer over to my right and to your left, we're going to be there to pray for you. We would love to just pray over you and just to to share um, just the good news of the gospel if you've never received Christ. So come on over.